Welcome to Musica Virtuale, a season online, presented by Gallery Concerts. Today we welcome organist Wyatt Smith, who will give us a tour and demonstration of a Baroque style organ, as well as offer a moving performance of North German organ music by Buxtehude, Scheidt, Tunder, and J.S. Bach. And now your host for the evening, Gallery Concerts Artistic Director, Nathan Whitaker. Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of Musica Virtuale. Well, spring has sprung, and it seems like we are creeping back to normalcy. There sure is good news all around us. And also some good news is that Gallery Concerts is doing something today that we are normally unable to do while in our home of Queen Anne Christian Church. We're able to feature the pipe organ. So there are obviously perks to these virtual experiences, and this is going to be one of them for us today. Before we start, please take a moment to visit galleryconcerts.org for a PDF of tonight's program, complete with Wyatt's bio and program notes. And while you are there, you could consider becoming a donor to Gallery Concerts this season. And also many thanks to all of you who have already donated this year. We are so grateful. Also, this event is an interactive experience, which means that you can and should take part in it. The live chat is on your screen. Please write any questions or friendly comments that you might have for Wyatt there. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And while you're at it, like us on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> Today, I am thrilled to be joined by Wyatt Smith, who is a rising star in the organ world. He has appeared multiple times on NPR's Pipe Dreams, is an affiliate artist at the University of Puget Sound and the Associate Director of Music at Epiphany Episcopal Parish in Seattle. But most importantly, he earned a Doctorate of Musical Arts from the University of Washington, placing him in the rare category of musicians and people that have impeccable taste, unflappable discernment, and are above average in every possible way. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Smith. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, and thank you for that marvelous introduction. Oh, well, you know, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to a, fe a fellow UW DMA. Um, we can feel very smug. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here with gallery concerts. We, we really haven't been able to, as I mentioned, feature the pipe organ very much because our, our normal venue, well, doesn't have one, um, which is a, a shame. But um, we're able to have you here today. Um, for those of you who uh, out there who may not have met you yet, um, could you could you uh, just uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yes, of course. I, I'm originally from uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, and uh, I've uh, come to Seattle uh, through school, as Nathan mentioned. I undergraduate at University of South Dakota and master's at Yale Institute of Sacred Music, and then the UW with the wonderful Dr. Carol Terry. So, and since graduation, I've been full-time here at Epiphany, which has been absolutely fabulous. Yes, absolutely. It's quite a music program that you have going there. Um, so I'm always curious, uh, you know, as a string player, I'm always curious when I meet a violist, what was it that made you um, uh, choose the viola or migrate to the viola, as it is in m many cases? For you, it's actually, uh, it's a, it's a, well, I'm not going to place judgment on um, the, 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 the hierarchy of the organ. Um, Mozart said it was the king of instruments, and who am I to argue with him? Um, but how did you become an organist? Well, it started in kindergarten and first grade when my mother put me in soccer, and I hated every minute of it. Um, so then in second grade, I started piano, and it was shortly after beginning piano lessons that my piano teacher was playing the 
organ in church one Sunday, and I saw she was playing with her feet. And I was just enthralled. And I uh, very soon after, I asked Mrs. Free, could I have organ lessons? And she asked me to wait three years. So when I got in fifth grade, I asked her again if I could have organ lessons, and here we are today. So in well, a nutshell. We need to send her a, uh, a, a, a um, letter of thanks and appreciation for for, for that. So um, I, I, I would, you're, we're going to soon see a, a wonderful tour through, through the, the instrument um, in Epiphany uh, Episcopal Chapel. Um, but I uh, was hoping you could just take a moment to explain uh, the difference between a tracker or manual action organ and then one of the, the giant organs that you might see at, for example, St. James uh, Cathedral, um, and, and what would be, uh, what's the, what's the, what makes a tracker organ a tracker organ? A tracker organ is essentially you control the attack and release of every note, guiding the palate open and closed through a series of what are called trackers and arms and elbows and whatnot that you'll see in the demo well fantastic let's let's have a uh let's have a, a look at your um your tour through uh through this wonderful wonderful instrument hello and welcome to the historic chapel here at epiphany parish of seattle in madrona Today, we will be exploring and hearing the many colors of this beautiful pipe organ built by Martin Pozzi here in Washington State back in 2015 and installed here in the chapel in early months of 2016. And this coming fall, we'll celebrate its fifth anniversary here in the chapel. It was originally dedicated by longtime professor of organ at the UW, Dr. Carol Terry. So, um, we are going to explore the different sounds and we'll peek a little bit inside the organ because this is a tracker organ, mechanical action, everything moves between the key and the pipe upstairs. All right. Here at the Posse, we will explore briefly the four families of tone found uh, on almost every organ. We start with the principles. The, this is the characteristic organ sound, and you'll be familiar with these pipes as they make up the facade of many instruments, uh, many organs throughout the world. Uh, here, uh, on the grate, we have the facade pipes. And we add in uh, the octave that plays an octave above. It's called four foot. We can do the same with the two foot super octave. glory of the principal chorus is what's called a mixture, which is a combination here of four different high-pitched notes that sound together um, that by themselves truly sound ugly. But in the context of eight, four, and two principles, you get So that's the principal chorus, the main core sound of every organ. Next, we have the flutes. And of course, these are meant to emulate different types of flutes, but also uh, organ builders throughout the centuries have had uh, 
fun, I guess you could say, uh, exploring different ways to build organ pipes and the different sounds that they produce. Um, here on the grate we have a roar flute or a chimney flute. At eight foot, unison pitch. We also have a quintendina, uh, which overblows uh, the twelfth overtone. We have a gedeckt in the swell, gedeckt German for stopped. We also have flutes at four foot, a uh, spitz float. We have a mixture, uh, uh, or not, not like this mixture, but a uh, gemshorn, which is kind of a flute, kind of a principle, somewhere in between. It's at two foot, so two octaves above. Next, we have uh, the strings, which this instrument has two string stops, a uh, viol de gamba, which is not like any viol de gamba that you've heard on the gallery concert series in the past, but the organ does its best. Um, it, it, the strings on the organ are uh, basically miniature principles. It, the pipes are much skinnier. They can sound a bit hollow. However, most organs also have what's called a string celeste, which is another string stop that's tuned slightly sharp to provide an undulating effect that gives the color a quite warm sound. Finally, we have um, the reed stops uh, commonly found on organs. Um, these include uh, trumpets, oboes, clarinets, crumb horns. If it existed, it's probably uh, imitated somewhere on some organ somewhere in the world. Anywho, on this organ we only have one reed stop and it's the oboe. It can be used in chorus or it can also be used as a solo stop. So, those are the four uh, families of sounds at the organ, um, and these are combined in myriads of ways which you'll, you'll hear uh, throughout uh, the program. So, uh, before we leave this short demo, uh, let's take a peek inside the organ. As I mentioned, this is a tracker organ, a mechanical action organ. So, Outside of the electric blower and these lights, um, everything is uh, mechanically connected um, by wooden trackers um, from the back of the key all the way upstairs into the grate and uh, swell divisions. So I'll be right back. I'm going to work some video magic and something's going to disappear. Be right back. So, as you can see, music rack comes off and it opens up this big gaping hole. Now right here at the front, we have what are called elbows and arms and whatnot. Um, and let's see, we need the grate, which is over here. So, and they're very, very small movements, and we'll get another shot in inside the organ so you can 
like th this goes all the way back to the wall um, and then all the way upstairs. So every, everything is mechanical. You can see this arm move inside the organ, easy enough to push things back here, and it all pops out here, can do the same here, etc. These are the way organs were made in box day and um, still being made today. It's fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. So, anywho, I hope you've enjoyed this quick little demo, or I hope I've kept it quick, um, and uh, pretty soon we'll be on to the program.
Oh my, that was absolutely lovely, absolutely fantastic. You know, um, a, f a few uh, episodes ago, Mark Desterbay was here and we were discussing what importance does music have during the pandemic and, and uh, certainly uh, to inspire was one. And when we listened to that triple fugue of Bach, it's hard not to be utterly inspired and then to, com to be comforted by music and that chorale prelude is is as comforting as a as a nice bowl of clam chowder with a side of cornbread. It's absolutely uh, fantastic. I'm going to bring Wyatt back in here. Uh, thank you so much for offering that performance for us today. Um, just it, absolutely it stunning. My pleasure. My pleasure. Well, we have a few um, questions for you coming in. Um, the, the first one is from uh, David Shutt. Um, it's about the mechanics of the organ, that he assumes that the uh, wind pressure on this organ is via an electric pump. Can you speak to the wind power source from when the music was written, obviously before electricity? Yes, so back in box day, those organs were all uh, uh, pumped, air, air was pumped manually, um, large bellows in the back of the instrument. Um, usually, depending on the size of the instrument, you, you could get away with one guy, you might need five, just depending on the size. Of, of course, the larger organs you get into France, you know, what, what not, anywho. Um, but huge, huge bellows. And um, some of them, you could think of them as stair steppers. Um, and you, you just get a lot of exercise. Do, do, uh, has there been any historical evidence of organists choosing um, repertoire or registrations based off of whether or not they like or dislike the person pumping the bellows at that particular time? That, that's a fabulous question um, for which I encourage someone to write a dissertation upon at the UW. I think uh, uh, there, there's a, there's a, 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 a yes, yeah, someone, there's room out there for, to, for spite registrations, um, yes. for someone to do some, some research into that. Absolutely. We have a, another lovely question from Anne. Um, hi, Anne. How lovely to hear from you today. Um, who asks, is there a pipe organ anywhere in the world that you'd love to play if you had the chance? As I begin to pick my favorite children, um, and I, I've uh, had the uh, many fortunate opportunities to play many instruments throughout the country and in Europe. So uh, there, there are several I, I'd still like to play, and two of them are uh, uh, London the great organ at Westminster Abbey and the great organ at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral. Those two are uh, definitely on my bucket list. Um, is there something about, is there something about them that you find particularly appealing? Uh, both uh, the colors of the instruments and the incredible spaces, which they are in, which uh, the space is often not considered by any other instrumentalist besides the organist. Well, it's true. You can't just uh, pick up your organ and, and, and go home and, uh, and, and practice it as you will and then bring it back. It's, it's built into the room. Um, yes. uh, and and uh, so many of these composers, I mean, Buxtehude certainly, but Bach was well known as a uh, critic of organs and, and someone who helped organs. And I assume part of that was tuning the rooms. Yes. Well, and, and just as a follow-up, um, I had the opportunity several years ago on a, a study trip from the UW, uh, led by Carol Terry. Um, we went and played organs uh, in Thuringia and Saxony, etc. And one of the organs was the Hildebrandt organ from uh, 1640, no, 1746, sorry, that Bach himself um, played and approved of for the town council. And playing this instrument along with several others, they tell you how to play Bach. Mm. Like we, we often in this country play Bach much faster than what sounds good on those instruments. Interesting. Interesting. So, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. Well, let's see. I would love for you to uh, speak for a moment about the uh, shoes that you were wearing. Uh, Linda Tsanis um, wrote in first off that she loves your socks. Um, secondly, what makes organ shoes so special? Well, um, exhibit A, uh, these are uh, um, uh, organ shoes. Most organists wear organ shoes. Um, uh, and they're made by a company called Organ Masters. Um, these are not Organ Masters. These are actually Capizio Latin dance shoes with a two inch Cuban heel. Um, and what the goal of any organ shoe is, um, uh, or it contains a soft suede sole um, for feeling your way around on the pedals. And it has the heel um, so that you can play, uh, especially in romantic repertoire, uh, legato lines moving from toe and heel back and forth between notes. And they're very, very flexible. So, oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. 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 Um, so this, the suede, do you, can you actually sometimes feel the, the, the pedal actually through your foot then? Oh, yeah. 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 That, yeah. That's the point. So it's um, very much a tactile sensation as well as uh, just for sheer comfort. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Well, fantastic. Um, why? I just would love to thank you so much for joining us today. But before I let you go, um, people might, well, they should need to hear more. They need more Wyatt Smith in their life. I mean, that's just the reality. Who doesn't need more? Dr. Wyatt Smith in their life. So where can they um, go to hear more of you? I understand you're um, making another appearance on NPR's Pipe Dreams in the next few weeks. Yes. Um, so the episode of, for the last week of April, uh, head over to pipedreams.org and uh, check out, um, uh, it's an incredible two-hour program dedicated to the music of Margaret Sandreski, who turns 100 years old this month, a fabulous organist and composer of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And uh, for this program, I recorded her five sacred dances on the two great organs of St. James Cathedral. And uh, this recording closes uh, this magnificent program. So head over any time during or after the last week of April. Fantastic, fantastic. And we also had up there uh, the link for the uh, Academy at Epiphany, um, of which uh, are, uh, you're, you're more than involved. You are heavily involved in. Um, yes. So uh, I encourage everyone to head on over to um, check, check that out as well. Um, well, Wyatt, it has been uh, a total blast hanging out with you um, and listening to, to, um, to your, your, your beautiful playing. It's really been a uh, balm um, to listen uh, to all of this beautiful music played so brilliantly on a beautiful instrument. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And I would like to thank all of you out there in cyberspace for spending part of your day with us. Believe it or not, we only have one event left this season, which takes place in just three weeks on Sunday, May 2nd at 3 p.m. Pacific. I will be performing and I will explore the history of my instrument, the cello, on its journey from an accompanimental instrument to its role as melodic soloist using the music of J.S. Bach, Vitali Dallabacco, and Luigi Baccarini. And please visit galleryconcert.org for more information, as well as to watch our previous Musica Virtuale episodes featuring Thomas Carroll, Caroline Nicholas, Mark Desturbay, and Jonathan Audi. Or you can even go and rewatch Wyatt's delightful performance from today. We're almost there, everyone. So let's continue to be smart, get vaccinated, keep wearing your mask, 
stay safe, and while you're at it, brush your teeth, floss, wear sunscreen, and wash your hands. We look so forward to seeing you next time.